Welcome to Ruby Thursday. I'm Jeff Denton. This is Ruby Snack number 67, Installing React with Webpacker. In this episode, we're going to learn how to install React with Webpacker and what all those new files mean. To code along, pull down the Ruby Thursday example app with this branch, git clone b ruby snack 65 single branch. CD into Ruby Thursday, bundle, run Rails DB create and DB migrate, and then, as we learned in the last episode, run yarn to install our JavaScript dependencies. Since there's a ton of information out there on how to use React, I'm going to keep this discussion on a high level and talk about how Webpacker integrates it with Rails. So what is React good for? Facebook, the creator of React, calls it a JavaScript library for building user interfaces. It's primarily the view layer of the MVC format. It can be used on its own or in conjunction with other frameworks. React uses the virtual DOM. It creates an in-memory data structure cache, computes the resulting differences, and then updates only what has changed in the DOM. JSS looks like a templating language, but comes with the full power of JavaScript. You can learn it once, write it anywhere. This is a huge advantage to React. Not only can it be used in your front end, but it could also be used on the server, although maybe not with Rails, at least not yet. It can be used to build apps with React Native, and there's even React VR, for real. And then finally, one-way data flow. Uh, so when the state has changed, an event is dispatched, the model gets updated, and then the state flows back down from the top and updates the UI. This is a diagram that describes the flux pattern, which relies on one-way data flow. It's a great example of how one-way data binding works. If you have multiple components relying on the same piece of state, you won't have to make it update in five different places when something changes. It updates at the top level and then trickles back down to all the components. This is a really important concept in Redux and makes state management much more predictable. So React is great. Let's install it. Again, Webpacker is going to make it really easy on us. If you're starting from scratch, you can run Rails new my app dash dash Webpack equals React. And if you're adding it to an existing project like we are, you can just run Rails Webpacker install React. I'm going to go to the terminal and paste this in here. And that's all it takes. Super quick and easy. You can also use Webpacker to install Angular, Vue, and Elm the same way we installed React. Now let's look at the new files that were generated. We'll start with the package.json file to see what new packages were installed. Since this is just a big list of dependencies, I'll make it easier and put them all on a slide. We've got Babel Presets React, Prop Types, React, and React DOM. Babel Presets React adds some ES6 functionality specific to React. Prop types is the runtime type checking system for React props. React, obviously, and React DOM, which provides us the DOM specific method for rendering our, your top level components in the browser. The reason it isn't included in the core React package is that, like we mentioned earlier, React is not only used in the browser, it's also used in native apps and VR apps, and those are mounted differently. In the .babelrc file in the root of our project, you'll see that this is where the Babel React presets are included. Like I mentioned before, this is extending the capabilities of Babel. Specifically, one of the things it's doing here is telling Babel how to transpile JSX. Next, we'll go to webpack loaders react.js, which just tells webpack, if you see this type of file, JS or JSX, handle it with a Babel loader. The reason this gets an extra step is because JSX is not really JavaScript. It's like a preprocessor that gives us some special formatting. It looks like a templating language, but it's not. It's a declarative syntax that's used to express the virtual DOM, and it comes with JavaScript packaged all in the same file. Normally, the special declarative syntax of JSX would break our code, but this loader, along with the React presets that were installed, tell Babel how to transpile the code into something that can be run in the browser. And finally, this brings us to hello react.jsx, found in the JavaScript packs folder. 
Webpack even scaffolds out a hello world for us. Hopefully after watching the last few videos, you already have an understanding of what's going on here. At the top of the file, we're importing React, React DOM, and prop types. Hello is our first React component. It's a stateless functional component, which as the name implies, is a component that contains no state. It's also a fat arrow function, like we covered in a previous episode. Any properties uh, required in this component get passed in through the props object. Here it's just props.name. This can also be written as a class component, which would look like this. In this case, we're using this.state to set the name, but in the case where the name is being passed down from a parent component, it would be accessed with this.props. One thing to look out for is that classes in JavaScript are not strictly classes. They're more like syntactical sugar over JavaScript's prototype-based inheritance. There's a whole lot going on there, but that's for another video. Default props, it's pretty obvious what's going on there. Prop types exports a range of validators that can be used to make sure that the data you receive is valid. Finally, we have the function that renders our top-level component to the DOM. It starts off with an event listener waiting for the DOM content to be loaded. When that happens, reactdom.render fires and it accepts two arguments. And the second is the element we're mounting to. In this case, we're creating a div element, appending it to the document body, and rendering our component inside of it. Alternatively, if you need to render to a specific element, you can add an empty div with an ID and render it exactly where you need it. And the last thing we have to do is add the script tag to the page. Any script inside the packs folder will get a JavaScript pack tag, such as this one, which is why you only want to include top level components in this folder. Everything else should be inside the new JavaScript directory. And I like to sort my files into folders by controller and then extrapolating as many reusable components as I can into a shared folder. You don't want to put this in your application layout just include it in the view where you'll be mounting the React component. To see this in action, well, first we're going to change React to Captain. Then we're going to take this pack tab and place it at the bottom of the Starship's index root. Then go back to the browser and reload. And there you have it, a high level overview of all the wonderful React goodness provided by Webpacker. That's a wrap for my series on JavaScript. I hope over the course of the last few episodes, you were able to learn something new about including some modern JavaScript into your Rails project. Thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun putting these videos together for you guys. Uh, if you want to see more, make sure you let Melissa know, and maybe I can come back and do a few more videos about JavaScript. Thanks. That's it for this episode of Ruby Thursday. If you are not already on my mailing list, head on over to rubythursday.com to sign on up and check out older episodes if you're new. If you are not subscribed on YouTube, you can click that big ruby there to subscribe. And here are some other videos that you might be interested in. YouTube subscribers get the episodes just a little bit before everyone else. If you have any comments or questions, it's best to leave those on YouTube. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you soon.